Hello, everybody. Um, you're all very welcome. I'm delighted to be here. It's our third international conference, and it's you know we've had a we've had a long road getting here. We uh, we, we we started organising it some months ago, and it's been it's been really really hectic. I think before we even start, we should really uh, and I, I'm not planning to do a whole list of thank yous. I want to do one thank you though, because um, Joe has been so extraordinarily helpful for everybody organizing everybody to get here it's been a huge amount of um logistical kind of challenges little did we know lisbon is the place for conferences and little did we know that there was no rooms available in lisbon and it really was quite a strenuous effort for joe so i'd like it if you could put your hands together and thank you So I'm going to start with a little bit of good news. Um, last year at Denver, the famous conference in Denver, we launched uh, the, the gender framework. It was a draft, a draft version of the gender framework. And the concept behind the gender framework was to promote and explore and explain a non-medicalized approach to gender dysphoria in all the different ways you could, whether it's socially or whether it's psychologically or whether it's in school. And we um, also put forward the, the kind of very strong argument about why same-sex spaces needed to be prioritized and you know the safety of uh, women and children should be prioritized in society. And so th that was a, a draft book of our own that we uh, l released in Denver. And this year, thankfully, I'm delighted to say we've got a publishing contract. So that book is going to be released in 2025. Yeah. So we, we can leave all the claps now because there's a few other things and you'll get bored with it. There's a few pi pilot, few projects are being launched today. Um, I'm going to name three of them and all three of them are very, very interesting. Genspect ourselves, we've started uh, today, we've launched the college pilot project, which is effectively a rating system. We've started with 10 states in the US and it's a rating system for colleges around the US so um, basically that you could rate them whether they are infused with trans ideology, which would be strong, whether they're a moderate take on trans ideology, which is moderate, <laughs> it's quite simple, or whether there is no trans ideology, which is none. So there's three groupings of these colleges. There, it's, uh, it's been launched on our Substack today and it's on our website today. And it's just beginning, it's a pilot scheme and the idea is that parents will help us with this because they will add comments and they will put in their own points of view because this is very much lived experience, to use the phrase, because parents will say, I went there this year. Because when a college, you know, when a college becomes incredibly ideological, it generally happens with the arrival of a new lecturer or a new professor who suddenly decides to kind of take, take kind of trans to the hilt. And what we want to know is just we want to inform parents so that they know which colleges are very keen to promote a fast-track medicalized approach to gender dysphoria and which colleges are not and which colleges seem to be moderate, which I think is the most interesting group because they could go either way. And what we'd like to do is inform them. So we're, we've launched that today. It's called the, the Pilot College Project, <laughs> fairly basic. And uh, we really welcome comments from parents specifically because we think it's going to be very, very helpful for people. It's going to be 10 states each week. This is, week is the first week. And so within five weeks, we'll have all the states. <laughs> then we'll take on the world. But we, we've, we've a feeling there's going to be a lot of comments, so it'll be an ongoing live document for some time. As well as that, there's a new website launched today that I think a lot of people would be interested in. They're over there if you want to get more information. It's called parentsofdesisters.info. And uh, this is a really ingenious idea. Um, a, a, a kind of, you know, a really interesting mother I know who, who's really thought about the trans phenomenon in all its different shapes and sizes. And she's created this website so that people can share experiences of their children who desisted. And it's a really difficult kind of feel. When your child has desisted, the usual kind of response from the parents is like, just get me out of here. I, I don't want it. I don't want to come to conferences. I just, I, don't want, I just want to kind of ha get my family gone out of this whole thing because we've been really quite hurt by it. And so it's a really generous thing to kind of let's bring together some stories of desisters so we can, you know, exchange maybe ideas and practical advice. It's one of those things that honestly, one person will work, one, per one thing will work for one person and it won't work for other 
people. So it's very much sharing the stories, very like Pitt, you know, Parents of Inconvenient Truths about trans. Some of the stories will absolutely sink to you and say, this is my family. And some of them you'll say, no, that wasn't what, for, well, that's the point. And I think that's what we're leaning into more than anything in Genspect, is not that we have any answers, because we certainly don't. We're trying to ask thought-provoking, intelligent questions so that we can come to better outcomes, so that we can come to a better understanding. We really believe that this, this you know, trans phenomenon is in, in its infancy. You know, for, for decades, People have been medically transitioning, but it's only in the last 10 years that they've been transitioning in serious numbers. And it's only in the last 10 years that children have sought, well, 10, 15 years, that children have sought medical transition in great numbers. And so suddenly, obviously, teacher, our parents um, are much more interested in, well, what is the long-term outcome? Well, when it was 35-year-olds and 40-year-olds, they didn't care about the long-term outcome because they were, they were usually maverick individual personalities who really weren't very interested. They were doing their thing and they were on their road and that's what they wanted. And so the addition, I think, of the parents into this field has actually upped everybody's game because suddenly they're saying, well, what, what is the long-term outcome for my child's fertility? What's the long-term outcome for my child's well-being? And what we have found again and again when you actually study the research is that there isn't reliable, quality, strong data to support the, you know, the fast track medicalization of children and vulnerable people. And so the, the website parentsofdesisters.info will give another view, I think, to something that really is, it's like all these strands are kind of growing in this world. And I, I really welcome every one of our new initiatives. And I, I really do urge, you know, uh, a gentle approach to all the new initiatives that are happening because it's very hard to start an organization. It's very hard to start a website. It's very hard to ma maintain energy and keep the momentum going despite um, all the very active and enthusiastic commentators that we have. Another, uh, <laughs> another uh, inaugural launch that we have this week, which is great. I'm really pleased and I hope they're here. I'm sure they're here somewhere today. Actually, they are because I said hello to one of them today. Is the launch of LGB Alliance in Portugal. That's being launched this week. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we, we're absolutely delighted to kind of support them and uh, they're, they're, somewhere, <laughs> they're somewhere around here. I want to have a look at this. So as, as you probably know, uh, Genspect is a large tent organization. We're not actually, there's loads of specialized organizations and we try to support and lift the work of all the specialized organizations because we need the specialists. But we also need the bigger picture. We need the wider lens. <laughs> we need, I'm laughing at my own jokes here. We need, <laughs> we need to understand, I think, in a very... I very emphatically believe that we need to understand the trans phenomenon from the wider <laughs> lens. From, because I think if you continue to focus on just the narrow field of interest, whether it's legal, whether it's education or psychological or medical, you're going to miss strands of the trans phenomenon. And that's why we are here. It makes our work very complicated, very difficult, because being a generalist, you're annoying everybody because all the specialists generally know more than we do, and we, we, we accept that. They definitely know more than we do. But what we're trying to do is specifically offer a platform for the general, su the general summary of what could be going down with the trans phenomenon. So today, I'm going to read out a list of all the, the wide variety of speakers we have. We've got three psychotherapists here who are speaking this weekend at the conference. We have two psychoanalysts. We have a counsellor. We also have Jungian ad analysts in the audience, and I hope they will ask their Jungian questions. <laughs> we have three psychiatrists. We have two clinical psychologists, two sociologists, a director of a therapeutic boarding school, a teacher, a retired teacher, a politician, three researchers, one pediatrician, one evolutionary biologist, we all know who that is, two doctors, <laughs> one feminist campaigner, a philosopher, a public policy expert in policy for medicine, two barristers, one specializing in child protection law and the other specializing in employment and human rights law, a choreographer, because every trans conference needs a choreographer, <laughs> <laughs> um, an activist, 
uh, two comedians, a journalist, bioethicist, and a couple of documentary um, makers. And we also have parents of kids who have two parents of kids who have medically transitioned will speak, a wife of a man who has transitioned, and uh, she later left him, a detransitioner, and a child of, uh, well, an adult child of a father who transitioned. So that's very much the life experience is, is very well catered for. And there's loads of different organisations because we're trying to support all the organisations that we think have, have worth. And of course, not all the organisations. There's some amazing organisations that aren't here, but there are some brilliant organisations that are here. The Lesbian Gay Alliance, that's the main one, and the Portugal one, and the Icelandic one. Uh, the founder of Transgender Trend and the, and the uh, director of Sex Matters, chair of CanSG, co-founder of SEGM, co-founders of, and members of Thoughtful Therapists, co-founders and members of Therapy First, co-founder of the Lesbian Project, two leaders of the Centre of Bioethics, the director of the National Progress Alliance and founding faculty advisor for the University of Austin, director of MCC Brussels, uh, the director of the Free Speech Union, director of the Academy of Ideas, the fellow at the Manhattan Institute, some members of the Killarney Group Think Tank and members of Critical Therapy Antidote, we are fair, members of We Are Fair Cop and Themis, Children of Transitioners, members of uh, and founders of Restore Childhood, president of the Center for Medicine in the Public Interest, founder of the Rosie K Dance Company and K2 CEO, and distinguished fellow of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, leader beyond trans, chair of the Danish Ra Rainbow Council, commissioner at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and the Glo Global Population Health Summit. So you can see this is a very distinguished group of people that we have here, and that's just you know the people who are speaking, and we have many more who are actually listening. So we really do have a, a, a room of experts who come at it from a whole variety of different positions. And I, I, I'm often being accused for being too ambitious. And I would argue, actually, we need all of us to be a good deal more ambitious. We need a lot of ambitious. There's a huge phenomenon that has happened. It isn't backed up by quality um, science. It's backed up by shoddy science, that once you read the research, you realize that it needs a lot more quality for it to be reliable research. And what we have instead is a very well-funded lobby groups that are very much promoting and fast-tracking very vulnerable people towards medical transition. And what we're trying to do is kind of encourage people to be ambitious. We need even more organizations. We need even more people who are coming forward and speaking up because we are minnows compared to what was already there, frankly, 10 years ago. We, we are way behind and we really have many, many, <laughs> so much work to do. So we, there's a need for co-belligerence in the face of threats to the health and well-being of children and young people children and vulnerable people. And at the, there's, the point over the next few days is not that we all agree. We're not really very interested in us all agreeing. We don't want all the psychologists to come together and say, yeah, we've got the perfect treatment plan. And we don't want the feminists to come together and say, we know how to overthrow the patriarchy. Or the legal team to come together and say, let's get the D-trans lawsuits and this will kill it. Because honestly, none of those things will really get the kind of what's needed or what's required. And what we require is every one of us and all our organizations to try to get into the mainstream and explain what's happening in lay people's language. That's actually our jobs. More than anything else, that's what's kind of the imperative for us. And that is really difficult. And so what we need to do is kind of disagree a lot. We need to kind of model the art of civilized disagreement. And we need to be free to disagree without people getting, ha having a heart attack. So that it's, because <laughs> I think that we've suddenly found ourselves in a world where disagreement feels almost threatening often. And what we're trying to do is say, no, 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 it's cool. This is, this is a world for disagreement. We welcome, you know, arguments. We welcome everybody who can be civilized and thoughtful when they disagree is as far as we're concerned, something that we all need. Because we, we're not anywhere near the end, we're not anywhere near the middle, we're probably maybe coming towards the end of the beginning of the trans phenomenon. So we're so much in the, like, in the infancy of this. There's so many embedded policies all around the world that presume A equals B, and we're there saying, hang on a second, there, there's so much to unpack. And if you think it's simple, and if you think it's easy, you're probably missing massive, massive, 
tracts of what's actually going on. And so we're trying to promote humility about our lack of knowledge, and we're trying to kind of promote a kind of a, w a new, not an even a new way, because this was like, you know, when I was growing up, it was very much received wisdom that we would just agree to disagree, and we would disagree with, you know, thoughtfulness and, and you know, um, civilized manner. But now we're in this new world where um, it has become very identity-based and it has become almost dangerous to disagree with people. Now we need to kind of show that we can handle being in a room, asking questions with other people and not, not kind of melting in the face of disagreement. Even over, you know, for example, I'm a psychotherapist and I tend to think talking will set us free and talking is the great God. And then sometimes I'm faced with, you know, I remember my, my husband saying it to me. He's a builder. He's here somewhere and he's been very helpful. And um, I remember him saying, like, Stella, like, I know you think talking is really cathartic, but I don't. I, I hate it. <laughs> And I was like, Jesus, maybe for some people talking isn't, isn't the answer. And the very same for, you know, trans kids. You know, it, it does not mean just because we believe it's all about talking, for some of them it'll be behavioural. For some of them it will be something else, social skills or practical or educational or, you know what I mean? I was about to say psychoeducation, falling back in <laughs> to my, my own kind of bias. So I, I think it's really important that we have enough humility to realize we don't know what is actually most appropriate for the people who are caught up in this. Later on, I'll be talking to Andrew Gold and we'll be talking about cults and cult-like behavior. And it's very, very interesting when people talk about that. And we have to keep a kind of a, a wide you know, kind of understanding of what we mean when we're talking about a cult-like behavior, because you can have cult-like behavior and not be in a cult, for example. And so when we think about this, we need to kind of, on some way, understand that when an ill and vulnerable person is speaking, the gender affirmative approach is presuming that they are speaking wisely. And often people from my side of the world are thinking, when they're Ill, Ill and vulnerable, it's our job to step up to our responsibilities and actually offer guidance. And that's, that's two different ways of thinking, but there's loads of other ways in between. I'm very concerned myself about the toxic empathy, the toxic compassion that is very evident in this world. And I'm very concerned about way beyond what I would call the, the trans phenomenon and into the wider world where the developed world seems to have got caught up in this kind of maelstrom of reactionary overthinking and that it's causing an awful lot more harm than good. And so way beyond, let's say, and we'll have some very interesting speakers tomorrow, Frank Furidi and Matthias Desmet and people who are talking about much more wider implications around society rather than just specifically uh, uh, about the, the, the kind of the, the trans phenomenon. Um, um, what else do I want to say about this? Oh yeah, I want to, of course, we couldn't um, mention today without mentioning, you know, Doubly Path are, you know, in town. And uh, they are, you know, when I, when I, when I look at the program, I, I think to myself, it's very technical in the WPATH conference. And I encourage people to go online, have a look and, you know, have a look and see, and see their approach. And you'll see this is very much technicians. And Eliza Mondegreen has written so beautifully about this. These are technicians who are thinking, this is how to do it. And if there's a problem with that, well, we need to improve the method. And if there's a problem with that, we need to improve the method again. And if you look at phalloplasties and the method, it's just a disaster. The, you know, the, the research shows that these are not going well at all. And they think, oh, well, we really need to put lots more money in, into improving the method. Well, Genspect is coming at it in a much more kind of thoughtful way, saying, well, do we need to improve the method? Maybe what we're actually doing is wrong. Maybe we shouldn't be doing something. Maybe when you promise a medical result that doesn't give the medical, doesn't give the psychological or emotional um, well-being that it suggests it does, maybe we should withdraw the, the, the interventions until we give it more thought. And maybe there's a philosophical, and I'm delighted the philosophers are here, because maybe there's a philosophical question about when you decide to present as the opposite sex, what you're actually doing, not only to yourself, but to your family, to your friends, and to the wider world. What is the impact of that? Because like I said earlier, 
Originally, these were very intense, very focused, older, usually males, who were just, let me get my uh, medical transition, get out of my way. They were in their 30s and 40s. They were a very different cohort. And now it's suddenly become normalized in this last 10 years. Everybody's thinking, but should we be doing this? Is this actually something that's causing more harm than good? Medical history has showed us many times over that we've often done more harm than good. Psycho psychology in particular has lost its way many, many times. We now have the CAS review. The research is in. We now know that there is no good quality research to back up this. But we also know that there's policies embedded in the WHO, the EU, the DSM, you know, all over the place. And we have the WPATH files. Mia will be speaking in a moment, and she'll give us more information. But we, we, we released the W... Well, we released, but the, the WPATH files were released in March. And it was, it was extraordinary that it was became evidence that not only did the clinicians within WPATH know that they were, not, not only were they causing harm, but they knew that they were causing harm, and yet they continued on. They, they released a, a really kind of half-baked statement, and then they moved on. And so I, I think I'm delighted that delegates from WPATH are over here. We've, we've had some contact with um, quite a few, and we're delighted that they've joined. They've delighted that people have taken us up on the invitation that anybody from WPATH is very welcome here, because we're delighted to open eyes. We're deli and I, I hope if anybody speaks up that we'll be only friendly and very kind of informative, because our job is to kind of open people's eyes to what we believe is going on, and I think we have a lot of knowledge in this room. Um, I do think we've come of age, even though we're, we're only at the, maybe the end of the beginning, and that we're moving beyond Twitter, and I thank God for that. <laughs> and most serious contributors at this stage have moved beyond Twitter. There are some great, you know, people who are, who are doing their job on Twitter, and I, I know what they're doing, and I know some of them are here, but I... Um, I'm delighted that we've kind of moved on as a movement. But when I started studying the, uh, the, the trans history, I realized this has always been fraught with really, like I thought like, uh, uh, you know, the tax on Genspec were like out of this world and this is insane. And then I started reading trans history and I realized, whoa, we're not even in the halfpenny place compared to some of them. So the radical feminists were really and truly, the radical feminists were, were really fighting some trans women, some radical feminists were in the 60s and 70s saying, get the hell out of our spaces. So they spotted it before anybody else as an issue because trans women, were trying to encroach upon female spaces and immediately, you know, getting voted in as president of the organization, <laughs> things like that. But then I was reading in 1973, there was a, the, amazing to think about it, it was the third annual symposium for gender identity in 1973 in Dubrovnik in Yugoslavia. That's what it was known at the time. Now, when you think about it, the third annual symposium on gender identity was happening in 1973. We tend to think, us lot are, you know, just starting to know about gender identity. Not that it was ha that there was symposiums, serious symposiums, serious think tanks in 1973 going on. And John Money was the chair, and John Money was the was the keynote speaker. For those of you who don't know, John Money is a psychologist who, who, you know, he 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 kind of he has been discredited because of his dreadful behaviour over uh, David Raymer, and you can look it up in the in the book by John Colapinto, As Nature Made Him. But it's a dreadfully tragic story, and it ended up in the death of not only David Raymer, but also his, his twin brother. But at the time, in 1973, John Money, very like W. Path at the moment, was saying what a success it was. So David Raymer at the time was only about eight or nine, and it wasn't a success, but it was kind of looking like a success. But John Money was very much pretending that it was a success, and he was kind of being dined here, there, and everywhere for it. They were at this symposium, and there was this guy called Milton Diamond. He was also known as Mickey Diamond. He was a young researcher from the Bronx, and he had been following John Money's work, and he was like, this doesn't add up. This just doesn't add up at all. And um, he... Uh, <laughs> so John Money was, there was a cocktail reception, it was a very posh event, and John Money was uh, at one end of the room, and Mickey Diamond was at the other end of the room, and this is after the first day of the conference, and suddenly John Money kind of stood up and bawled across the room, 
and excuse me for my bad language, he goes, Mickey Diamond, I hate your fucking guts. <laughs> and the whole conference kind of went into stunned silence. And John Money walked over to Mickey Diamond and actually slugged him in the jaw. He actually whacked him. And then there was an altercation, then they were separated. This is the alleged story anyway. And uh, Mickey Diamond was very kind of deadpan going, the data is not there. The data is not there. <laughs> the data is not there. This is in 1973. So, uh, you know, when I think of myself and, you know, the man in the blue dress and all that, and I'm like, that's, that's just play acting compared to getting whacked in the jaw. <laughs> so that kind of cheered me up quite a bit. And, <laughs> and it made me think, if, if I was over in WPAT today, all these years later, 50 years later, if I was over in WPAT today getting slugged in the jaw, I would be... Mickey Diamond saying, the data is not there. The data is still not there. And frankly, I think, do we need any more proof that the data is not there? We, we, <laughs> we know it. What we now need to do is start kind of learning to kind of gather our strength and kind of speak truth in a time of, of propaganda. We need to learn how to kind of speak out towards the lay people so that we can get way beyond the... Um, the in-person echo chambers that we tend to talk in because it's safer there and it's much, it's so kind of frightening beyond the echo chamber. But I really hope after this weekend we do get more people who speak out. Generally after every conference we've had a huge amount of volunteers joining us and we very much welcome them. They've been huge and lots of them are here today helping. So uh, now I'm finally finished. <laughs> um, I want us to welcome uh, the lovely Mia Hughes. Mia, I first got to know Mia, um, first of course on Twitter, but after that uh, we met because we were organising the launch of the WPAT files and uh, you know I consider her a friend now, I think she's an amazing person. And she's incredibly thoughtful and incredibly thought-provoking. And whenever I speak to her, we kind of stumble into conversations that I didn't, hadn't thought about before. And the name of her um, talk now is, is you know, equally thought-provoking because he says gender dysphoria and incomplete diagnosis. And you know, the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, you know, it changed from gender identity to gender, gender identity disorder in 2013. As we know, for a very purposeful reason, it got changed to gender dysphoria. And to call it an incomplete diagnosis is very interesting. Certainly, I, I don't agree with it as a diagnosis. I think there's a lot better out there that we could be using. This is what we're using right now. But that, now that we've shone a spotlight on mental health in general, that's really common in mental health. You know, we very often have inappropriate diagnosis, inappropriate names, words that just don't fit the behavior, so it's, it's really common, but because we're in this world, it feels really, really heightened. So, um, without any more jabber from me, I'd like us all to welcome Mia Hughes. I'm looking for her. <laughs>